if you start a business with your wife, there are only two possible options. You have a really strong relationship or you get divorced. There is no middle ground. Like there's nothing where like, oh, nothing really changed. And the strong relationship chance I'm saying is about 20% and the divorce is about 80%. Long story short, probably not a good idea for most people to do it. Thanks for coming on the show today. Pleasure to have you. And uh, I reached out to you originally because I am impressed with what you're doing in the language space. I was checking out some of your companies. Uh, you've been on a bunch of other podcasts. You've got a great personality for podcasts as well. Uh, but then when I first met you a few weeks ago, I noticed you have the uh, insanity gene that a lot of entrepreneurs have. I think to be successful, it's uh, just this like innate uh, obsession with like building companies and just, you know, taking things to the like, you know, 11 out of 10, 12 out of 10 spectrum. Uh, you know, you're into heavy metal like me. I, you know, I, you're doing martial arts and <laughs> you told me about, uh, you know, Kendo. I was, you know, re Googling that and, you know, watching some YouTube videos. So uh, I'll just, you know, see uh, anything you want to add to that intro and then we can kind of roll into this thing. Sounds good. Well, Brian, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely relate to you make it sound a lot better than it than my wife would put it. You said, you know, the entrepreneur gene, I am pretty much sure the doctors call it ADHD. But hey, apparently most <laughs> entrepreneurs have that. Um, but it served me well in my life so far. And I'd love to, you know, chat about some of the stuff I do because business is my sports. I, I was that little geeky kid when I was, you know, in high school and all the rest. It was really bad at sports. And I finally found a sport that I like, and I'm actually pretty decent at, which is entrepreneurship. So yeah, yeah. it's kind of been my passion for 15 years. Yeah, it's an interesting way to think of it, too. I, uh, it's, you know, it's like, a, it, it is a sport in a way, it's like a mental sport, but it is, Absolutely. you know, it's competition, it's, you know, kind of perseverance, creativity, thinking on the fly, like all the elements of a, a sport. So I like that analogy. Uh, why don't you just kind of kick off with telling about uh, telling us about your business, uh, you know, the multiple companies you've created, I think a mm -hmm. few in the language space. Is that right? All bootstrapped? Yeah, all my companies have been bootstrapped. So I like to joke that if somebody gave me like $10 million to start a company, I wouldn't know what to do with it, because that's just <laughs> not the way I've done it. So me little too, background. Yeah. So I mean, you know how it is, right? Because we watch every dollar. And I think it helps us grow more sustainable companies in the long term, like my longest company I've had for 15 years. When you're looking at people online, they're like, everybody wants that like unicorn six months, 12 month success story. I joke that if I ever wrote a book, it'd be seven years to seven figures and nobody would buy it because nobody wants to hear that you like have to work hard and show up every day and do the fun and the boring stuff in order to build your companies. So a little bit about what my background is. Um, I was born in the Philippines, grew up in Turkey. My dad is from the United States, but grew up in Zimbabwe. So my comp my family is kind of from all over the place. Excuse me. <clears throat> but I come from a family of academics, not a family of entrepreneurs, right? So what do you do after high school? You go to college. Like that was just the thing. What do you do after college is you get a good job and you work there for 30 years. I, like I was on that path. Um, I don't blame my parents for it. They wanted what was best for me. And I did that. So I went did to college. college? And I, yeah, I did. I went there. I got a degree in computer engineering. I worked in Silicon Valley. I did some, you know, I worked for one of the big five consulting companies. What was your grade average when you graduated? Oh yeah, that not that not that good. Nah, <laughs> like I, it wasn't on my resume when I sent it out, right? So, uh, one of the things is also so I went to a pretty decent school. Like my dad went to Harvard. I have aunts and uncles who went to MIT. I mean, you know, so they're really into academics. My sister was a straight A student. I was the black sheep with the um, straight Bs, but I. I I didn't know it at the time, but now I like to tell people I was like the Pareto principle of studying because I knew I could get a B by studying 20% of the time, then go out and play computer games or play with my friends for the other 80% of the time. But in order for me to get an A, I had to put in 100% of the work. And I was like, I didn't want, just didn't want to do that. I wasn't like interested in most of the topics that they were teaching at school enough to go and put in all that effort. I'm like, B. So, you know, I have, a, I have an Asian mom, like, you know, B, B plus. They're like, look, you could do better, son. But it's also not like, wow, you're bombing out of school. You're awful. Like, look at all these grades. You know, you really need to do better. It's good enough. You get an A in there every once in a while just to make them happy. Um, and that was kind of how when I went all the way through school, all the way through college. Well, you're so you're showing me up. I, I didn't go to college and I graduated high school with a 2.0. It came down to one one test at the very end. Oh, uh, it was like for diploma. I used to I, I did. There were a few I, I did in college. My grades did go down, especially the first two semesters until I got into stuff I was interested in. Um, but 
I'll be the first to tell you. So my wife's a teacher too. I mean, like I come from a, like teachers and academics all around me. My son might have to go to college because of his mom, but not because of me. I think I'll add that in there, right? Because I think I could have done a lot more and been much more successful as an entrepreneur if I hadn't gone to college. So in college, and this is, I mean, you know, historically shown, schools were made to train employees. I mean, that's the reason that they did it during the Industrial Revolution. They put around schools because they didn't want the kids running around the factory. And they built these school systems so that when they get out, they had a stronger workforce, which worked great for the United States, which is why the U.S. became a superpower, right? It was one of the first places that did this. In today's world, and for people like you and I, Brian, who want to be entrepreneurs, that's not quite the right path, right? Um, you know, we're there's something that's in our mind that just makes it a little off for us when if somebody tells me to do something like that's I don't want to do it. Like as, if somebody orders me to do it, that like turns me off. If I want to do something myself, I'm super passionate about it. So it was the same for me after college. I but it took me a while to realize it. So I graduated from college. And I did what everybody else is supposed to do. I went and got a good job. I was a computer engineer and I wrote, you know, wrote software, you know, at these companies, Silicon. I did my tour of duty in Silicon Valley. But after a while, I got, I felt like something was missing, right? I was, you're just sitting there, you know, I had a good job. I had a condo. I had a nice car. What do you do next? The American dream. You get a bigger condo, a nicer car, and then bigger TV. And then you just keep on doing that for the rest of your life, right? And that's supposed to make us all happy. Um, but I just felt like something was missing. So there was actually a moment that this happened for me. I was at a bar in Cleveland, Ohio, where I was living at the time. And I remember I was standing on the stage. And unlike you, Brian, I was not a rock performer. And I wasn't like performing. It was just there was nobody there. And like a bunch of us were standing on the stage because it was so crowded down there on the floor. And I remember looking out and I knew a lot of the people in the bar. I was what, like 25? And some of those people were like 35, 40. And I'm 40 now, so I feel like, wow. At the time, I'm like, wow, they're so old. And I'm like, I don't feel that old right now. But I remember looking out at them, and I knew they were in the same bar with the same people for the last 10 or 15 years doing exactly the same thing. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, I don't know if that's what I want out of my life, right? To be in the same bar with the same people doing it. There's nothing wrong with that. And I still know some of these people, and they're very happy with their lives. But just at least for me, that wasn't it. And there was a commercial on TV at the time for the U.S. Navy, and they had this quote. And I've been looking for this commercial for years. Like, it's not even on YouTube. Like, I can't find it anymore. But they said, if they were to write a book about your life, would anybody want to read it? And I remember, you know, getting home drunk that night and I kind of just seen that commercial on TV because I turned on before I went to bed. And I was just sitting there staring at it. And I'm like, no, if I keep on this track, I would write a book and I wouldn't even want to read it. But I'm a computer engineer, sits in a cube every day, writes code and goes back to the same house and does the same thing. That's not the life I want to live. So at that point, I literally the next day, I one went quick on there uh, one quick ahead. thing on that before you keep going. Yeah. Uh, I just heard uh, uh, on the My First Million podcast, Sean Purry was telling a story that's very similar. When he was, I think, in Australia, he was in he went to some like startup like tech meetup or something in mm -hmm. Australia, and uh, it was his second or third time going and. He went up and started kind of talking about some ideas he had. And then at the end, the moderator comes up and goes, hey, man, you're really smart. You should uh, run. You do you want to like be the speaker next time? And at first he felt, you know, like honored, like, wow, this is awesome. Thanks for, uh, you know, asking me to do that. And then 30 seconds later, he immediately said, uh, wait, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I've never built a company and I've been to like two of these things. So mm -hmm. if I'm the smartest person in the room here, I need to get out of this room. I need to be in a room where people say, shut up, you're stupid, sit down. <laughs> That's it. And actually, I'd love that. I'd love to be the smart, don't be the dumbest person in the room. And I've tried to live up to that. And, you know, we'll, we can get to some of those stories. Because in the recent years, I have definitely been the dumbest person in quite a lot of rooms. Um, and they've been my biggest growing experience um, throughout all of it. So going back to the... The story, you know, that commercial was on TV. I literally, the next day I went online and I applied for the US Peace Corps. It wasn't like, mm, I'm going to become an entrepreneur. I actually said, I just want something more interesting. So I applied for the Peace Corps. My dad was in the Peace Corps in the Philippines. And that's how we met my mom. And so I'm like, I've known about the Peace Corps my whole life. So I'm like, hey, it'll, they'll send me overseas for two years. I'll get back to the US. You get like full scholarships to go and get masters. And I can change my career into like, know, international business. So I can travel a little bit more. That was my plan. So I went to the Peace Corps, got paid $150 a month living in southern Mexico for two years, met my wife at the time. She was my Spanish teacher. She studied college in the United States. Um, so she spoke, she speaks fluent English as well, but she was my Spanish teacher. Right when we were done the Peace Corps, they give us a $2,000 check. And I really didn't want to move back to the U.S. So I turned to my wife and was like, why don't we just launch a language school together? Like, I know nothing about business, but hey, why not? I'm like, you know, we're in our 20s. Worst case scenario, I'm a computer engineer. 
you're a bilingual teacher. Well, get good jobs. We were dating during the Peace Corps and we got married right afterwards. So that's so what, like, just give it a shot too or something? Or this would be 2006. 2006. So this would be in 2006. Yeah. So we finished up the Peace Corps. We went back and we did like my version of market research because again, I don't have a business, but I didn't have a business background. We found a city in Mexico to launch a school. I learned about something called SEO, you know, 2006. This is, you know, right now everybody knows about it. Back then, most people did not. And it was a totally different thing back then. Just put some um, keywords in your meta keywords, right? Oh, I had software that would spam comment like blogs all over the internet. I'm like, <laughs> back then, oh, all man, this you were one of those assholes. Oh, I'm an old school, old school. I'm, I'm, I'm an OG at the SEO world. Um, and so we launched a school. And since no other Spanish school in Mexico had a full-time SEO, I was learning, teaching myself, but you know, I had a full-time SEO doing it. Before we even launched, we were number one in the country. Like if you look for a Spanish school in Mexico or learn Spanish in Mexico, we would have come up number one. Thing is, we weren't even open yet. Like we didn't even, I had like, like stock photos of like cities of Mexico around the website because we didn't even have it. But as a result, we were fully booked the day we opened. Like I had $2,000 in the bank account. We couldn't afford furniture. Luckily, we had this family coming down of 10 and they just went to pay everything up front. So we took that money and we ran out and we bought furniture like a week before they arrived and kind of put stuff in there. We would have to like change up rooms. We would sleep in our office on an inflatable mattress with a hole in it that, you know, we would sleep on a mattress and wake up on the floor because we couldn't afford to patch it up either. So we left, slept there for a few months. And that was our first business that we launched. From there, our, we launched an online business, which is now Live Lingual, one of the top five online language schools, kind of came out of that. We sold the brick and mortar schools, which was a chain of brick and mortar schools by the end of it. Um, and then after that, that's how our entrepreneurship journey started. I've owned a chocolate factory, a marketing agency. Um, I've exited from those. I've had a bunch of failed businesses. And right now I run Podcast Talk. And I am a partner in an entrepreneur community that's growing right now for you know seven-figure plus entrepreneurs that want to meet other seven-figure plus entrepreneurs, and but also meet them through experiences. So we do experiences around the US um, and the world. So we just they did a trip to Morocco recently. We've dog fought over. Red Canyon uh, in Las Vegas in stunt planes before. I mean, we do all these kind of events, but it's it's a networking thing. But we actually do some cool and fun stuff while we're doing it. So all of that led to where I am today. I want to get to that M3 uh, on uh, community. Uh, you, you might be able to court me as a member even. But Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, going back, uh, that's pretty cool. So your first uh, swing was a, a success then, right? Your, your first, first two. My first two were a success. So I remember thinking back then, if you've ever heard that phrase, the more you know, the more you know, you don't know. I didn't know yeah. anything back then, so I thought I knew everything, right? And my first two businesses were successes. Now, no Facebook success. They weren't seven figures. The school got to mid to low six figures. But when you're living in Mexico and you've never had a business before, I'm like, look, I was taking on like $10,000 to $15,000 a month in profit. Single at 26 in a country where that's worth like triple. I was like, I'm a baller. I'm like, okay, I still didn't have a car. But at least, I mean, you know, we... I could buy the rent and all the rest. I just didn't have any time off. This was a brick and mortar business. I, we would work in the summers 90 days straight. I would do the tours on the weekends and I'd work on the weeks and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you we'd sold have that company that. That, that, that was a more We sold that. Exactly. We sold it. Okay. Um, the new owners, unfortunately, in 18 months ran it into the ground. Uh, um, so they, they weren't able to do it. It was a wealthier retired couple from the US. And unfortunately, again, I didn't know what I was doing. So I'm like, hey, they have money. They want to buy it. Great. That was like my only criteria for selling my first company. And now that's not my criteria anymore. And I've sold the other ones and I want to make sure that the people are there and they keep the, you know, the staff employed. The good news was I ran the online company, which means I was able to hire all the people that got laid off of the brick and mortar schools into my online company. All the Spanish teachers just kind of flipped from my old company to my new one. So I was actually able to provide job security, but that was not intentional. Um, that was just, we felt so bad. We're like, hey, come on over here. Let's, you don't have a job anymore. We can give you a job. Um, so a after the two back-to-back uh, -back wins and before the oh, first loss, dozens did, you get, and uh, dozens. Yeah. did you get like beer muscles on the first two? That, that was pretty much it. So <laughs> I got, so a lot of us entrepreneurs, we talked about at the beginning of that business ADD. And unfortunately, I'm a computer engineer. What does that mean? It means I can launch an online business in like a week, right? I mean, I just have to think of an idea. I'll write the basic code, come up with the MVP, the minimum viable product, and I'll launch it myself. Like, you know, I, and see if anybody wants to buy it. And I know SEO. So I can get it up on the first page of Google. That's actually a curse sometimes too, because there's more to just building the MVP and getting it on the first page of Google to building a business. So I had dozens of websites where like half finished business projects and I still have them. There's like sitting around the web. Some of them they make like a hundred bucks a month and I'm just like, hey, you're paying your host. <laughs> I'll, I'll, get, I'll get back to that at some point. Um, I want to hear I some did, of those too. Like, what are they? But oh, we'll I, okay. So the biggest, well, we can go to, we can go to it in a second. Um, 
Yeah, so I pretty much did that for a long time. And as a result, unfortunately, live language just hit a plateau. We were one of the first movers in the online language space. That's how we were able to get at the top. And if I had focused on that, we would be so far ahead right now that nobody could have caught up. Like, I mean, you know, the only option would have been like a seven-figure acquisition. Well, all, all your competitors are venture-backed. I was I was looking They're at all venture-backed, exactly. And um, uh, like, what's uh, Italki or whatever is one? And there's- That's you know, got I, 4 million. Preply's got 40 million. We're the, only, we're the only bootstrapped in the top five. Wow. So we get people wanting to invest in all the time, right? Because they're like, wait, you have no delusion in your equity. Everybody else has like series A, B, C, D. Who's, who's like, number you, one in the space? Right now, number one, as far as SEO is concerned, would be Preply. But, but what's revenue? I, you don't know their revenue? They don't. They're None of them are public. So none of them post their revenue. But I can guarantee to you that their play is not making money because... They raised 60 million, you said, right? 40 last I heard. 40. But they had, a few, they had a few rounds before that. So add that together. Maybe they got up to like 50. You know, yeah, what's like the TAM in this space? Is it like a big TAM or is it relatively small? It's it's relatively big, but the problem is it depends on how you play it, right? So at LiveLing, what we go for quality so we can actually, we're looking to actually teach you a language, not necessarily go in the volume space, right? So our competitors, in order to pay back the $40 million in VC, they need to get 100 million, you know, 50,000 users on there every single month. For example, and probably right. most of the TAM goes to just one-off tutors, right? Like Craigslist that's or uh, that, yeah. and that's what they do. They go in there. It's a they are a tutor directory, so anybody can go on there and be a tutor. Brian, you can go on there, and I can go on there, and we can start teaching English. And I don't know about you, but I have no business teaching anybody English. Like, I mean, you ask me a grammar rule, and I'm like, I have no idea. I'm like, you know, I could barely spell my name. My wife corrects it. me on my English speaking probably three times a day. So that's it. In my mind too, and my wife's not even a native <laughs> English speaker, right? I mean, she corrects my English, so. No business, but you and I can go on there tomorrow, register as English tutors, and they would let us, right? That's what it is. It's essentially like match.com um, for some of the older listeners here, I guess, right? You know, you go up there, it's a, it's a directory, you can go and, go and find everybody. But And then they bring in these students, and they might take one or two hours, but most people will never learn a language that way, right? For us, you come in, and we give you a course, and we have a higher, it's a higher ticket item, but we will give you a course. All of our teachers have college degrees, minimum three or four years teaching experience, average of about seven years of teaching experience. We're going in this kind of other direction in order to actually teach you a language. So it's very different business models. But, you know, you and I are in this space. So, like, I know how much they bid on, like, Google AdWords, and I know what the economy is. And I'm like, there's no way they're making money. Like, there's absolutely no way with them. But they're not. I think a lot of the bigger people are going in for, like, the Starbucks model. Like literally they're trying to outbid everybody. So like just to crowd out the market with everybody into their service and to take their valuation up because you know how SaaS products are valued. It's not necessarily on income. It's on user growth, right? So they want maybe to get this, next, uh, this next couple of years might work in your favor because uh, yeah. these venture backed ones, if they're burning a lot of money, they're not going to raise another round. At least That's... it'll be a down round, which will be their death nail. That's and, it. Uh, you know, and then if they don't raise another round, they run out of cash. Now there's market share available for you to snatch up. You you're obviously in the space because you and I are thinking the same thing. Like I'm one of the few people in the US. I'm like, please, recession, please, please, please. Like <laughs> let's go for like two years. Because that's exactly what I'm thinking as well. Yeah. We have been profitable since we started and we still are. We've grown at a steady clip of about 20% per year every year. I mean, that's by awesome. Silicon Valley standards, that's like that's not what a Silicon Valley investor wants to hear. But for an average business owner in the U.S., if you've been growing twenty percent per year for twenty for fifteen years, I mean that'll ha- probably put you in the top of the Inc. Five thousand. Yeah, probably, I mean if we, yeah. we're not quite there yet, but we could. Yeah, I mean we we're just going to keep on doing it, and we're fine. Again, I still live in Mexico now. Like you know, I make U.S. dollars and I spend Mexican pesos. Like I have a cook and a cleaner and a maid. Stuff in the United States is like Rockefeller stuff, but like with the income we're making here, I pay my staff really good salaries and we have job security in ours. We're not stressed out. We're not looking after the next shiny object. We're not like, oh, we need to get, you know, 10% growth because I have a meeting with the investors next month. There are no investors. The investors are my wife and I. I'm like, you know, I'm, I have a date with her next week. That's about as close as to an investor <laughs> meeting as we're going to have, right? Um, and that's and the right, bootstrap right model. Your, uh... You know, right right off your restaurant reservation there. Exactly. Well, absolutely. We talk about business. I mean, you know, work-life separation doesn't really exist because we've been, <laughs> she's my partner in this business, right? Um, that's good. And that's kind of what we've been doing for the last 15 years. It, I'll be honest, we never expected it to get this big. Like if somebody goes out there and is like, what was your business plan for 50, I'm like, 15 years? I was trying to pay the rent. Like, you know, the, that was my business plan was make enough money to pay the rent. Dude, there's there's something to be said about just like scrappy uh like I, I so there's scrappy just like needing to pay the rent 
Mm-hmm. There's uh, not knowing, like the thing you said earlier, I want to bring it back, not knowing what you don't know. And the less you know, it's like the more it's, you know, it's almost like to your favor. It may, yeah. There's some some parts how it, you know, like the experience part where you might make stupid decisions, you miss on that. But, uh, you know, not being able to talk yourself out of why you should take a shot makes you That's more a- likely to take the shot. And you should, because, you know, not to go up on cliche quotes all day, but, you know, they they say at the end of your life, you regret the things you don't do way more than the things you did do, right? You know, the girl you didn't ask, that pretty girl you didn't ask out, you regret way more than the, if you ask her out, she says no, you might not even think about it again, like a week down the road, you're like, oh, that sucked, and then move on, right? But you will always regret not taking the shot. Business, to me, at least, is the same thing. Now, I want to put a caveat in there. I don't think most people in the world should be entrepreneurs. It's becoming trendy these days that like everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Well, actually, so the first guest I had on this podcast, I don't know if you've ever heard of Technically Media, um, Chris Wink, who's the CEO. They're really big from like New York City down to DC. They're they're like the tech crunch of the of the mid-Atlantic. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he's been studying entrepreneur trends uh, for the last you know 15 years. And uh, what he was telling me is that entrepreneurship, while like on social media, it's trending more actual registration of new businesses actual like hard data huh. entrepreneurship has been steadily declining since the 70s i could believe that because it's hard work it's easy to say you're an entrepreneur like if we went on linkedin right now and you did a scrape and said how many people are like put ceo or entrepreneur on their profile probably a ton but actually being an entrepreneur it's a grind i mean like unless you have like some really rich parents what was it? The easiest? What's the easiest way to make a small fortune? Start with a big fortune, right? So if you <laughs> if you have really rich parents who give you ten million dollars, you can be an entrepreneur. But the most of the rest of us mere mortals, we get up and being an entrepreneur. What does it mean? My first business it meant I cleaned the bathrooms, I took out the trash, and then I put on a suit to welcome people to school before the you know before they got there, and I would be there until eight o'clock at night so I could you know sweep up and clean. Our building got flooded a few times, so my wife and I were there with buckets, emptying it out, drying it out. Two hours later, the students would arrive. We hadn't slept all night. That's being an entrepreneur, you know, especially if you have to bootstrap things. It's not glamorous, no fancy cars, none of that stuff. Even today, I drive a Mazda. I mean, you know, yeah, we have successful, you know, seven-figure companies. Like, like for me, the fancy cars are not what I do this for anyway. But it's not what you see on Instagram or Pinterest or TikTok or any of that kind of stuff. So I definitely could see on the, you know, everybody I could see on TikTok and Instagram – they are entrepreneurs, but one of my favorite books is The Millionaire Next Door. If you have, if you know, I recommend it to a lot of people here if they haven't it. read Check it. it out. Yeah, no, it's it's a little dated, so take all the numbers and multiply by two because you know inflation and all the rest of it. But they start. My favorite story is right on the first chapter, where this is written by two economists, right, and they were working for one of the big investment companies. So they have to invite like the hundred richest investors in this company to a meeting in you know, this fancy dinner in New York City because they went to market research, right? They went to find out a little bit more about them. So they order foie gras, high-end wine, you know, Michelin star chefs, all that kind of stuff, invite people in. And they're waiting there for the first person to arrive. And this guy walks in, he's got jeans and like a white t-shirt on and a cowboy hat. And they're like, this guy's lost. And this guy kind of like walks up to check in. He checks in. He's like one of the three richest people on their list. And they're like, what the heck? Must be a coincidence. So he sits down and he's like, they offer him all this fancy wine. He's like, do you have a Bud Light? And they're like confused. So they run out and they get him a Bud Light and they give it to him. He's like, that must be a fluke. But then the next guy comes in. It's the same. And then the next guy comes in and it's the same. And they start doing like the whole night they sit down and all these presenters are in these business suits with this Rolex and everybody else sitting there just looks like the average Joe you pass on the street. And that's what's kind of spurs this whole study of who really are these self-made millionaires in the United States. And they find out it's not who you think, right? I mean, you know, it's not the people who drive the super fancy cars. Sure, they live in nice houses. They do drive luxury cars, but they always drive used luxury cars, usually about two years old, because then they know that, you know, depreciation of 50%. So they get it for 50%. They get their Cadillac for 50% cheaper than the guy who bought it new. And a two-year-old car with 10,000 miles off a lease is in great shape still, right? So they drive it for three or four years and they sell it because the appreciation there is only like 10% and they sell it for, you know, so they're essentially paying like 50 bucks a month to drive a Cadillac because between the the differences in the prices, there's all these cool studies. Don't give, don't give your kids a house because they've done studies on all of that. So I love the book and I listen to it once a year, but the average millionaire, you wouldn't know if you blast them on the street. Yeah. Um, you I, wouldn't think, even know I think if you lo- their house. low millionaires. I, I know a lot of people who 
who make a lot of money or have sold companies for large numbers, uh, you know, eight, nine figures. And, uh, and they definitely that's indulge, the next, yeah. but, That's the next, know. I mean, but you know, they're, they're here. They're talking about the millionaire next though. That's the hun- 10 millionaire or the hundred millionaire. That's the guy who made $125,000 a year and just saved really well. We're talking, we were talking about earlier about being the dumbest person in the room. This is a great segment to that. So I had this amazing opportunity last November, a buddy of mine runs a very su- successful cybersecurity company, kind of sends me an email and says, Ray, would you like to go and have lunch with Richard Branson? <laughs> and I was sitting there, I'm like, is this a joke? He's like, no, no, no. I'm going out to Necker Island and would you like to come with me? It's a, it's a small invite, only a event. Now, I had to pay. It wasn't like a free thing. And the price was, yeah, way more than I've ever paid for anything in my life. So in the beginning, I said no. And then I went to my lunch. like, oh, yeah, my buddy just invited me to meet Richard, Sir Richard Branson. And I said no. And she just looks at me. He's like, he's your entrepreneur idol, right? And I'm like, yeah. Don't be an idiot. Go back and tell him, say yes. We'll figure out how, we, you know. Okay. She also jokes, I'm never buying you a birthday present again. Because did you do it? This thing. I absolutely did. So uh, last November, I was out on Necker Island with Richard Branson and about 20 other people. Um, it was primarily a charity event, even though due to the cost, everybody who was there who was attending was an entrepreneur, right? Because if you didn't own a business or at least one how of them How many people like, well, did it with you? 20. Maximum people, people can fit on his line is 25. Um, and it's, it's not all like just big... like at the same table. He's there eating with you. So here's oh. the, yeah. Uh, it was much, the first night we were there and you go into a place called the Great House. Uh, and I was sitting around, you're just chatting with this fascinating people, like everybody there. I had severe imposters. In. Remember, dumbest person in the room. I definitely felt like that, right? So I'm like looking around and like we're talking people who's built, you know, $100 million companies around me. And I'm just sitting there chatting with them. Um, oh, the president, Sir Leaf, was there, the first female president of Africa. So I ch- chatted with her for a little bit. You know, Simon Sinek was supposed to be there. He canceled at the last minute. Like that's the level of people there. And then me, which is a very, very different. Now, tying back to M3, the guy who invited me is uh, through M3. M3. He's a buddy of mine through the entrepreneur group. So we got there. And so they invite us out to dinner. So Richard has, is not like us mere mortals where if, you know, if you wanted a long table, I would take like five of those long plastic tables, put it together, put a tablecloth on, right? Not him. He looks like he'd like chop the sequoia tree down the middle and had it like hand carved. And it's like sitting there in like the middle of his balcony, which is like looking out over the Caribbean, right? So I go to a yacht out out in the water waiting for him. There were like a few of them around because the island in front is owned by Larry Page. And so like, I mean, literally, these are billionaire islands. Like every island is there is owned by a billionaire, right? Um, So there were so many fascinating people. Believe it or not, I am an introvert. So it takes takes some work. But I'm like, I'm going to sit in the middle of this table because I want to have an interesting person to my left, to my right, and in front of me so I can talk talk with as many people as I can. So I sit down and I turn to the left and I'm talking to this, their artist and resident at Google, at Google and Boston Dynamics, right? The ones who, she like paints robots and they just wow. pay her to do that. Like that's her job. So I'm talking to her and then I turn and look in front of me and it didn't even occur to me, but where does Richard sit? Of course, right in the middle of the table. So he sits right in front of me on the table on his, on his island and to his left sits President Sir Leaf, Nobel Peace Prize winner and first, you know, first female president in the whole continent of Africa. And to his right, sits Dr. Astro Teller, who runs the Google, the X, Google X, the moonshot factory of Google, like, wow. you know, where the, where the smartest people in Google work, he's like the smartest person who runs the smartest people in Google. Like I'm sitting in front of these three people and I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh my God, what do I say? Now, the cool thing is like Richard, I think part of his success is he's super charismatic and he's like, he just draws everybody to the conversation. Pretty soon it felt like you're talking to some guy you met at the bar. Like, I mean, there was nothing like, hey, I'm one of the richest guys in the world and I have a fleet of private jets. No, it was just like, hey, how's everybody doing? That goes about 15 minutes. And then he turns to President Sirleaf on the right and says, Madam President, you remember that time where Mandela, Kofi, you and I were sitting back there and we were trying to figure out how to end the Gulf War? And first off, who uses Nelson Mandela and Kofi Annan in like a casual conversation? It's like people you hung out with on the couch. Like, like that's not something that normally, at least not to me, at least is something that normally happens. Yeah, I remember that time. They chatted, good times. Yeah, those, yeah, those were good times, right? We almost ended a world war. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, that was last weekend for me. I did that too. Um, so they <laughs> chat a little bit there. And like, I, what am I going to contribute to this? You know, if you build backlinks to your website, you're, it'll rank higher in Google. Like I had nothing to contribute to a peace, Nobel Peace Prize winner and a billionaire, right? He turns to his left and he starts talking with Astro Teller and he's like, you know, you guys have any cool projects on global warming? And they started talking about the science of building seaweed that can capture it. And then they crush it up and they throw it into like these trenches and later it becomes diamonds in like a hundred years and something like that. He's like, yeah, I've been looking for a place to put about 10, $20 million. Let's talk after this. So we can sit and chat because I've been looking to, you know, invest a little bit into that. 
my whole point is like at that point, I was just like quiet, maybe asking some questions, but like me contributing to the conversation, absolutely nothing. Again, dumbest per- in this case, dumbest person at the table was me, right? I'm like, I have nothing to do there. But the interesting part, the revelation for the whole thing for, was that came out of all of that was um, I intellectually understood everything they were saying, right? It wasn't like they were saying words that I didn't get or had concepts that I didn't get. But my revelation was, I don't think that big. I don't dare to think that big, right? I don't know about you, Brian, but you don't wake up in the war- morning and f- think about how to end the war in Ukraine with Russia. That's like not the first thing that pops into your head, right? You don't think about you, it. You know what I've noticed? The older I get, the smaller I think. That, I think so. We were kind of losing a little bit of that. But those three, they were all you know 20 years older than us. But that's what they think every morning. How can I end world hunger tomorrow? Like that is what they're thinking. Not how can I give a hundred bucks and feed a kid in Africa, which is a great cause, but how can I end the hunger for every single kid in Africa? That was my big takeaway from this. It's like, look, most of us, I don't know why, we just don't think that Did big. Did it change anything for you? Like having that revelation, how have you absolutely that into your life? Absolutely. So before I was just making enough to like, you know, I just financial security and all the rest of it. I wanted to build maybe, let's say, a $10 million company. Like, why am I not trying to build a $150, you know, $500 million company? Why am I not doing that? Not because of the money, because now the impact that I can have on people's lives is so much more than running, you know, Live Lingua, I got about 140 staff, right? I mean, across the board. So let's say I directly impact them, plus the people we teach languages to. Podcast Talk, one of my other companies, a small team, like six or seven of us. I'm impacting them. Um, M3 through the the group, it's just starting, but we want to have about you know 200 members, maybe impacting them. Sounds great, but why can't I impact 100,000 people, a million people, make a million you know, people do lives? It's funny, like I I have a friend who uh, he sold his company a couple of years ago to GoDaddy for I don't know the exact number, but it's like mid eight figures probably. Yeah, F you money, uh, as they say, right? Yeah, yeah, like he has enough that he doesn't have to work again. He's mm-hmm. you know he's past that point, uh, and him and his wife are business partners too. I want to ask you about that as well later, but. Uh, it, the uh, so he sold it for like you know slightly above fu money you know like retire mm-hmm. for life money I mean you know ten million dollars you can pretty much like live on interest so most of us could yeah exactly yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, most so, people yeah especially yeah. if you're in Mexico probably half that yeah way less uh, than that yeah so um so yeah he sold it for that amount but then he you know did the GoDaddy thing uh for a little bit and then uh he uh he was doing an M and A and buying companies for, you know, $500 million or like $800 million. And the story you shared with me was, all right, so I'm sitting in these rooms with these people who are selling companies for 10 X or whatever, you know, 10, 20 X, what I sold my company for. Mm -hmm. And there's literally nothing that separates what I'm, what I know and what I do to what they know and what they do, you know, like as far as like attributes go. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's like, it's, it's a thinking like scale, like how, 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 uh, it's same, the same epiphany. It's like the scale on which you think. And now he's figuring out, he's like concocting his next plan on how he's going to 10 X his last thing. <laughs> that was it. And that was my, and that's what I'm looking at. Like, how could I build something bigger and have more impact than I could before? And it's just like him. It's not that we are physically unable to, maybe there's a lack of knowledge, but knowledge is relatively the easy part. I don't think so. Thing. He's pretty sharp. I, I don't think there's a lack of knowledge there. I think he could yeah. do a, a billion dollar company. Exactly. But there's also the other question is, is that really what you want? Right? Because also, let's just say, like you said, after 10 million, what's the difference? Right? You're, you can take private jets everywhere you want, you can, you know, drive a Ferrari around and make no dent really on your lifestyle. Would 20 million make that much of a difference? 30 million, 50 million, 100 million? No, probably not. I, don't think you I can mean, fly private jets on 10 million. I think that's a little, uh, bars a little. Well, bit. I'm saying you, you rent, you get the tickets. You, it's there about $7,000 an hour. So if you went on a, like a trip every year, and that's everybody on the jet. I've actually, I have actually looked into it because my dream is to get enough money that I can actually fly. <laughs> I don't, that's not owning a private jet. That's about $60 million plus whatever maintenance of gas and all the rest. That's a totally different thing. But flying on private jets at 10 million. You're, you know, just off of interest, if you're getting 6% 6 back, you're doing pretty well. You take, assuming you take one or two trips a year and you're not doing something stupid at home, your house is paid off, all the rest of it, it's not going to make a dent in your life. Yeah, right. I I guess you're right. I mean, for me, I, an expense that size, I feel like, I feel like I wouldn't think about 
even considering flying, even, you know, doing like the lease thing or the, the, the time, the timeshare model or whatever they call it, the, the net jets yeah. thing. You could, but about I mean, like you, you could physically could where you, where you well, do that. Everybody, but you, you physically could, right? I mean, a 10 million, if you wanted to yeah. take a jet over to Europe with your wife today, it would cost you, let's say 60 grand round trip, maybe something like that. Right now that would that hurt? I mean, that's a big expense, but could you do it? And would your life, would you be bankrupt when you got back? Probably not. So that's the difference. I mean, if that's your priority at that, at 10 million, you could do it, right? Uh, especially if the rest of your life was normal. But again, if you do that, plus buy new Ferrari every three months, plus live in a penthouse in New York City, yeah, your 10 million is going to blow out of the water really, really quick. But there are certain things you can do it. I live in, you know, a moderate, a nice, you know, regular house, drive regular cars. And I want to fly, fly private jets. Like, you know, that that's going to be like my splurge that I do every year. But everything else, I'll look like middle. I mean, class. if that's your thing, like if that if that's like your your guilty pleasure. I love to travel and I hate flying. That's why I do it. Like, you know, get, going to the airport two hours earlier, getting stuck in customs, having to transfer planes in Tokyo and almost not making your transfer because you're running across and you're carrying a two-year-old whose diaper needs to be changed. Yeah, that's what I... I'd much rather just show up to the flight 15 minutes before they leave on my schedule. I show up exactly to my last destination whenever I feel like it. Don't have to go through customs in any of them because at those private terminals, you don't. You just kind of walk into your plane. They just that, ask That's a name. damn good guilty pleasure, though, man. It's like, oh, I like follow the dumb or, you know, it's like I like Michelin star restaurants or, you know, I just like to fly private jets to Europe. That's it. And then when we're in Europe, I will get, you know, fast food, you know, there on the street. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> I, okay, I do like Michelin star restaurants too, so that's another one. But um, so my guilty pleasure is travel, actually. So in, my wife and I, we do travel, try to travel well. But when we live our regular lives from like the rest of the year, you wouldn't know we weren't just like working at a company. Like, you know, you wouldn't know that we're doing well, um, financially speaking. But travel is where we've always splurged. Like for my birthday, she rented me a Ferrari in Tuscany for like a day. And we drove oh, around. So cool. Yeah, it was, it was a blast. I was scared driving that thing because I was like, what if I ding it? Like, you know, you go in Tuscany, by the way. Well, so we Florence is where they picked us up, and then we drove through the kind of Tuscan countryside. So that we were, I was following a Fiat 500, but like a souped up one. So it was my chase car, and they're like, nice. "Whatever we do, chase us, because whatever a Fiat 500 can do, even the souped up one, your Ferrari will have no trouble keeping up with us on the street." <laughs> so they were doing that because I would never have gone like the speeds I was going because I'm like, I don't know these roads. I'm not Italian. So we were driving there. Dude, we were in we were in Italy last year at Monte Pulciano in Tuscany. I got three speeding tickets in the mail when I got back home. They, they <laughs> well, mailed me three speeding tickets. This was not my rental car, so if there were speeding tickets, it got <laughs> ma mailed to the rental company, right? I'm like, I never got any of those things. Um, <laughs> And or maybe they have a deal with the local police for all I know. There I don't know right? how any of this works. <laughs> but we had what they on that tour, they, like they shut down a Castillo out there. Um, so that you, if you pull up in your Ferrari and they like let you off the hold. It's a restaurant, you know, like old house that's out there. Um, you go inside and, you know, they have photos of Richard Branson, Bill Clinton, Bill Gates, who had eaten there at this table. And they sit us at the same table and they give us the same food. And we were sitting there like, wow, this is how, you know. I mean, I'm sure for Bill Gates and the rest of them, that's like a normal thing for this. Is, this was like, ah, this is fancy. Like the whole restaurant was just for us. It was a very yeah. cool experience. So that's what we pay for when we travel. Then I get home and I'm wearing a T-shirt I got for free at a conference. Uh, you know, I still have for my fraternity days in college. I still have those T-shirts upstairs. I have no designer clothes. I have a nice computer, but, you know, I play computer games and I'm, I work online. So business expense, right? <laughs> as far as that's concerned. But that's how we do it. So we splurge on those aspects of our lives. And with COVID, we've been able to save up a lot because traveling wasn't a thing for the last two years. But in the yeah. next six months, we have a lot of trips coming up. That's cool. Um, I, one last thing on on the Richard Branson thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Curious, how much the how much were the tickets for that? It was about thirty thousand dollars per person for four days, and you share a room with somebody. Wow. Okay. That's not that doesn't include transportation or anything. I mean, that's just. I probably would have had the same first reaction you did. I'm no, like, I was just looking at I'm like, what? Like that's that is orders of magnitude more than I've spent for any other like vacation. Yeah. Like, you know, this thing Ferrari there, not even in the ballpark. Like, like renting yeah. a Ferrari for the it was like three bet. grand or something. Yeah, it was like three grand. I mean, like the whole thing. Like not even close. And that was until then, like probably the most expensive like splurge I had ever done. And then this thing comes around, it was like 30 grand. And you got to, it took me two days to get out to British Virgin Islands. Because there's no direct, even though on the map you look at Mexico and like BBI, it's like it's the Caribbean. It's like a three-hour flight. No, you go to the U.S. You got to go to Puerto Rico, and all the flights to the Puerto Rico arrive at like three o'clock. But the last flight, the Bridge of Virgin Islands, arrives at, leaves at two. 
So I had to spend a night in Puerto Rico, fly over there, and then you take a two-hour boat ride out to the island. Wow. And I remember asking one of the people on his team, and it's like, wow, it's a pain to get here. And she's like, what do you mean? He's got 60 private jets. He doesn't do any of that. He just flies directly to the island, then he flies back home. I'm like, oh, yeah, that doesn't actually make sense. Like, you know, why would you get some places so rural? He gets it because it's rural because super wealthy people can fly right there while the rest of us mere mortals have to do, like, more connecting flights. And all right, stuff. all right. I get the private jet thing now. You got me so no, Exactly. The, now I just got to uh, pop off one of these uh, $50 million companies and I'm good. Working on it. Working on it. That, that, <laughs> that's my next one. So, yeah. The podcast talk is actually my play in there. That's I want to get a multi-eight-figure exit. I've done the six-figure and seven-figure exits before. I want to get eight. Um, well, eight you said it in exit. public, so now you got to do it. Uh, I, I do it. Um, you know, one of the things that surprises me, I actually had a, a call this morning with somebody, uh, a consultant is working with us, but she's also a friend of mine. And my wife is the one who brought this to my attention, right? If you, people don't do what they say most of the time. And to me, that's just a very confusing concept. Like, if you're going to say you're going to do it, do it. Otherwise, just don't say it, right? And I know building an eight-figure company, there's things that are out of my control. But will I do everything physically possible to do it? Absolutely. I'm not waiting for a six-month overnight thing here. I think it's going to take me about seven years or so to get there at the rate we're doing. Do it, but yeah, I mean, I've seen I've seen people build companies, ridiculous companies, um, really fast. And yeah, I hope it'll happen faster. But I'm not doing this with the expectation that it's going to happen in twelve to twenty four months. I'm in here for the long game. Yeah, yeah, especially. I, reason- I think I think the bootstrapping is a difference because you know, like these. These people who bu- who build these like billion dollar, you know, five billion dollar companies, you know, when they exit or IPO, a lot of them own well, you're like diluted. less than 10%. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, totally diluted. Like less than 10% at that point. And at this one, I do have a partner, but he's, you know, I, I still own by far the large majority. And we have a few like advisors, like pretty well known people in the podcast space, like Pat Flynn and Jordan Harbinger. And they have small shareholders, they're small shareholders as well in the company. But I'm, you know, at this point, I'm still 70 percent 70 80 percent owner of the yeah. company but you got as long as i can keep like 51 uh, percent, that's my rule yeah it's like 51 percent's me because i don't want to be bottlenecked by like taking a decision because i have to check with everybody else i'm willing to bring on some other partners or even maybe investors in the future but the investors i'm not doing the vc so i'm with this business specifically luckily with the exits like i as long as i don't touch my savings right now we're fine for retirement right um i just need to make enough to pay my bills until retirement, still 20 years from now. So, uh, you know, I got to do that. Um, I just don't want to have to wait 20 years for it. So I'm like, let me see what the whole VC thing's about. I've never done it before, but like you, I hear about all these companies that take VC money and then they exit in three years for $50 million. So I read a few books on VC and then I decided, no, I absolutely do not. Having a VC is like having a boss, right? Because they gave you the money. Now they have shares and they can fire you from your own company. And you have to report to them every month or three months and tell them why you make a decision. And they breathe that's down your neck. Do it, but yeah, well, that's exactly it. But, but like most people, especially like me, they take advantage of it because like I don't know what I'm doing. So they're going to run circles around me. I would take investors. When, you know, I want to get to a certain point before then because then you have a lot more bargaining power. If, we, if I can get it to like three or four million and then I'm like, okay, I'm... I want to raise a few million for investing. I have a pretty strong position to come from, but not the VC investors. These are investors who are like, okay, you know what the vision is. This is what we're doing. We're doing it for an exit. We're holding on to it for three, four years. Here's the plan. Let me do my stuff and don't don't butt your nose in. And but I set my own terms at that point, right? It's like that's it. I mean, take it. If you're not interested in that, fine. I mean, you know, our business will continue to grow with the clip it's growing, and I'll be fine. Um, if you want to be part of the ride and make it faster, we'll do it. So I might consider that up to the fifty, my fifty-one percent on this business. Um, but it's nice to have those previous exits so that you kind of, you know, like it's not my rent and food and my son's college is not. I'm not risking any of that for this company, right? It's like Nathan. This, Barry, this is my fu money. Yeah, this is no, me uh, like my moonshot, right? I'm like, if this makes it, awesome. If not, I'm still fine, right? Yeah, that's uh, you know Nathan Barry's story. Oh, yeah. I actually, I've, I've met Nathan a few times. I'm in an entrepreneur community with him. Yeah, he's got like a really similar mindset. It's all bootstraps. Mm-hmm. I just heard something about how he does like secondaries, but I think that's more for selling the, um, for employees that want to like, you know, because he gives stock options, I guess, to the employees. Mm-hmm. And so his employees that want to get out, the only way to do it would be to, you know, do a secondary. But uh, that's uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, I think even MailChimp was bootstrapped too, right? I've heard the VCs are involved now, but yeah, initially that was how they, how they all got out there. And, you know, I have another, 
like you were talking about ADD, like Backlink Hippo. I, I'm actually launching a SaaS product for building backlinks in January. Um, oh, yeah. Is it yeah, yeah. yet or it is? The website is there, so it should launch in four weeks. I don't know when this is going to be. This episode is going to be published, It'll so be it might be live. Week, by probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you're get if you're listening to this before January first, twenty twenty three, it might not be live yet, but it will be live um, by then. Uh, so like everything, I, I wrote the MVP myself. It's all there. The video on the homepage you're looking at, Brian, is not the final one. I just put one a placeholder, but I'm actually getting that one produced <laughs> right now. Um, but the the reason I bring it up is the beauty of backs of um, bootstrapping is I get to do stuff like I want. So back like you know, the fun thing is I'm pretending I'm actually a hippo, and the whole website's run by hippos. So like all the copy is like, yeah, you you know, silly humans, you. You're not as smart as hippos, but we built this awesome SEO software for you to build backlinks with, and you can use it if you pay us. <laughs> like, you know, a VC would look at that and like, what are you doing? That might say, you know, turn some people off. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm bootstrapping it. I am tired of writing friggin' corporate copy that's like, here's our features and here's all the stuff we do, or even like good copywriting, which is, you know, tying to the emotions. But let me just have some fun. And if people think this is doesn't work, that's that. I mean, but I build tools for stuff I need. Like I build backlinks. I build my business on SEO. If you're familiar with the skyscraper link building, right, which is you write it, you create a cool piece of content, then you find the top 10 or top 20 ranking for that content, find everybody who links back to them, email all those people and see if they want to link back to your newer, cooler piece of content. Oversimplification, but that's it. Generally right now, these days, like for me to do it, I have to use multiple tools like Ahrefs, Hunter.io, right? I mean, like multiple steps and a Filipino VA that combines all that and cleans it all up. I was able to figure out how to do it with two clicks. Like literally, wow. if you went up there and put in, you know, Spanish tutors online and say, I want the top 20 results in Google, US based, you can choose the country because you can say, you know, UK results or whatever. And hit start, it will do all of that for you. It'll get the top 20 results in Google. So is that what everybody... Backlink Hippo is? is that, that's is what Backlink, it? that's exactly it. It'll so be everybody's right? linking back to it. Yeah. And then it'll give you all the emails of everybody who linked back to it. And you download it as a CSV and you can do whatever you want with it. We also get the social media stuff if you want, you know, like- It might be a customer account. of yours. I'm going to share this with my uh, digital team. Awesome. <laughs> I, we're, we're opening up for, if anybody listens to this, we're opening up for 50% beta starting January because we're just going to open it up for like beta users this is just tested internally for now um, just to get some feedback on it. You'll also see the design. It's on purpose, like really, really kind of simple. But then you read in the copies, like we're hippos. We care about functionality, not design. So if you're, you know, if you're offended by this not having pretty images, that's it. But it's literally, it's two clicks. You do it, you come back the next day, you'll have your spreadsheet ready. Like all, all of those other software. Even if it doesn't make money itself, I'm going to use it in my own companies. So like that's- Humans or machines it. doing the work? Oh, no. Well, it's software. We have software okay. and scrapers and stuff like that built all over the place. That's they cool. go and do it. We do a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, we have some algorithms back to clean some of the emails. It won't be perfect, but we so give you a score on all the data emails. process though, because it depends on how many you have. It could be in like in five minutes, right? So if you wanted something like, I don't know, pink flamingos for sale in Philadelphia, probably five minutes because those top 10 results are not going to have too many backlinks to them. And they're not going to have too many emails for us to get. If you wanted us to search for books, which means the number one's Amazon, number two is Barnes and Noble, number, and you know, yeah, getting all the backlinks to that in every single email, that might take a while, right? So most, we've done some testing and generally it's like an hour, two hours, like for most, if you're doing SEO well, or if you're bootstrapping SEO, you're usually going for lower hanging fruit anyway. You're not going for those $50 million search volume keywords at the top. This might be your eight figure exit, man. This is uh, th this is a good business. Every single agency, you know, there's tens That's of thousands what we of figure. agencies out yeah. there. Yeah. And we, it's literally two clicks. It's well, actually the second click is just a confirmation. Like you could literally do it in one, but we're like, let's confirm first. So it's click one, click two. You can actually do comment to limited keywords. So you can just put like your keyword list of 20 in there and it'll just go boop, 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 boop. And depending on the plan, we'd like, you know, you can run three campaigns at the same time or 10 campaigns. We will What's build the, an agency. Do you backlink. run the campaigns in, in backlink hippo or do they have to use like grow bots or something else for that? For the email outreach, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. We do that. Uh, you have to do that yourself uh, because we do that in podcast talk. And wow, is that a headache, right? Because yeah. in podcast talk where it's a, it's a model where you can actually pitch podcasts on autopilot. So pretty much we have a date. We've built the cleanest database of podcast contact information in the world. So we have all the you know podcasts that are out there. You can go in there and search and say, give me every podcast about SaaS products that's still active. So it means they've had an episode in the last 60 days and have at least 50 episodes and have at least a 4.5 star rating on Amazon and have the word, you know, tennis somewhere in the description, whatever. I mean, you can create your own algorithm. You hit search. It'll give you every podcast in the world that does that. You can then filter it manually if you want. 
then you can build campaigns and we send the first email, second email, third email, four, you know, fourth email follow-ups, you pitching you to be a guest on their show. So that's actually getting pitching podcasts on autopilot. So that's also what I'm looking at as potential eight, eight figure exit there, because you set it up once and forget, you don't even have to come back in. We just email you every time somebody replies and says, yeah, I want you on my show or asking you asking for more information. Like you don't even have to come back in there. My joke is podcast talk is getting you six pack abs at the gym without you having to get to the gym. So as a result, I have been on over 150 podcasts in the last 18 months using nice. my own That's podcast awesome. talk. And I don't have to do almost anything, right? I mean, for you, you reached out, but like most of the time, it's just, I have podcast talk running in the background and I do it because I'm like, you know, the old hair club for men. I'm not only the president, I'm a, I'm a member. That's kind of, I'm trying to get on a thousand podcasts ask podcast talk. I'm like, look, this is the power of podcasting. You know this, not only the reach, but in podcasting, it's a lot of work. I had my own, pop I have had failed podcasts before. Like I've had my own podcast, like nobody listened to. It's a lot of work. You find the guests, you have to interview them. You have to do the background research. You have to edit, you have to throw it up. Even if you have a team doing it for you, it is work. Going on somebody else's podcast is a whole lot easier, right? You just go on there you talk <laughs> about something you're passionate about. They do all the editing. They do all the distribution. They do all the social media. And you can actually build entire businesses around just being, you know, using podcasting as a marketing channel. So that's what we're trying to do over at Podcast Talk. Backlink Hippo, I'm just trying to make that link building outreach as simple as physically possible because I did it manually for years. And wow, that's mind-numbingly boring. So all my businesses are stuff like that. Like I just find things that I need and I build them. And if somebody else needs them, great. But, you know, we'll do that. Yeah, the email thing. uh that would be super powerful if you could automate the entire, just like how you do for the podcast, but automate that second piece of it for backlink hippo. I think that is like the next, uh, that, the next well, that, level. That's absolutely it. So not to geek out too much. I know that you built do Laravel. I build everything and all my soft SAS are built on Laravel. Um, are you an engineer? Least, yeah. Yeah. Well, I have programmers who do it. And obviously, you know, I'm, I have a computer engineering background. My coding is a little rusty because I haven't done it full, you know, full time in a long time, but I know enough to go in there and just do the basics. And build the MVPs, cool. right? I build the MVPs. Good coders would probably look at my code and it's like, that's not the most efficient way to do it. And I'm like, I don't really care right now. I'm like, nobody's paying me yet. When I get money, I'll pay for somebody else to go and fix it. Um, like at LiveLingo, I wrote the MVP. I have the dev team over there. Podcast Talk, I have a dev team over there. Backlink it was too early. Don't have a dev team built out for that one yet. Um, so basically, you know, that's how I do almost all of my businesses. It's go in there build the MVP, then hire somebody else to do it once somebody pays me money. That's bootstrap. Like, I'm not going to pay money to somebody else until I'm making money first. And this is the fun, the fun part about it. Yeah, I, I'd love to um, I, I'd love to talk with you offline about Backlink Hippo. I think I, I got some ideas Absolutely. for you. But uh, uh, two things I want to go back to. So uh, <laughs> there was uh, this story about the millionaires dressing uh, down. So I have a friend who sold his company to Oracle uh, probably 10 years ago at this point. Uh, it was like a $125 million deal. So, uh, you know, to Oracle, that's like, you know, you know, pocket change for them. So uh, he's like, yeah, we're probably not going to meet Larry Ellison. They flew out to California. They're meeting with the lawyers. You know, they didn't think Larry was going to be there. Uh, but then it turns out they did. He did book a meeting. He wanted to meet them before they signed oh, wow. the deal. So uh, they set up a meeting. They're waiting in his office. He shows up 30 minutes late. Comes in uh, like you know stains t-shirt, wearing like a baseball hat, uh, sneakers, eating a McFish at, you know out of the <laughs> McDonald's bag. And uh, so that you know right right to your point earlier, it goes yeah. you know his whole wardrobe was probably you know 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and you see a lot of people doing that, right? I mean, like, you know, you looked at um, Steve Jobs, like nobody, he didn't dress in Gucci. I mean, like that, that was not his look. Larry Page, if you met him, on, honestly, most people past Larry Page on the street wouldn't even know was, who he was, let alone that he was a billionaire. I mean, you know, they'd have no clue. Even when I met Richard Branson, I'm like, you look at his photos, he got jeans and a t-shirt and like a button shirt. Maybe these are fancy from fancy stores, but like, there's nothing about it that exudes wealth, right? He's not like gold rings and gold chains and you know, fancy clothes that obviously look perfectly manicured for him. None of these people wear these things. Money is just a side effect of making an impact, right? They made big impacts, so they have money. Um, and one thing that I like, you know, another phrase that I've heard that I like is money doesn't make you anything. It just makes you more of who you already are, right? So if you're a nice person and you have money, you're not suddenly going to become an awful person. You're just going to probably use it for charities, right? If you're an awful person, you make a lot of money, you're going to be a more awful person, right? I mean, you're just going to be able to amplify all of that. 
And I think for a lot of these people, it's the same thing. Like, look, they did not do it to buy fancy clothes. That was never their goal. That was never their interest. Maybe they have a nicer car, but I bet you it's not a Ferrari night. I mean, you know, it's a Tesla. I mean, you know, which is a nice car. It's expensive, but it's not. I think the Google just, guys were just really just data nerds. I think they were just that's really it. super that's interested ex- in data that's and all the, the internet. They're not famous. I mean, like, again, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Do you know what they look like? I, I know what they look like, but uh, most but we're people in the industry, don't. right? Most people on the street would have no idea. They would walk into a restaurant right now and you would have no idea that you were sitting next to the two, you know, two of the yeah. richest people on the planet have no clue whatsoever because they celebrity wasn't even their page. You know, their Larry members. Page has been out of the spotlight, too. I don't know if you he has like a some sort of thyroid issue or something mm-hmm. uh, that paralyzes vocal cords. And I've when he talks, that. he sounds kind of like like a Kermit the Frog kind of voice. It's but uh, even Larry Page, who would most people not in our space would not recognize him if you walked down the street. Yeah, yeah. And there are tons of, you know, the lady who used to run Coca-Cola, first female CEO, she was from India, I can't remember her name. Most people wouldn't recognize her if she walked down the street. I mean, these are like titans of industry. And it not she wouldn't, you know, maybe on her clothes, you can look at nice clothes, but that's the point is they didn't get there because that was their goal. They got that their wealth was like a secondary thing that came out of that. And those are generally, at least for me, the people I respect more. Right. I'm not. Oh, for sure. Without a doubt. I want to make, you know, $50 million. I used before meeting me to represent and I'd be embarrassed to say that out loud. I'm like, no, I'm gonna make $50 million in the circle that, you know, the people you and I know that there are plenty of people who've done it. I know people who've done it. I think I can do it too. And but I'm not going to go out and buy something like I'm not going to, I'm still not going to dress in Gucci. I'm like, that's not going to be a thing. If I have $50 million in the bank, it's simply not. I'll never own anything Gucci, but it's funny that like every single time you reach a new plateau, it's you already want to go to the next plateau uh-huh. before you get to the the one that you're headed for. That's the fun, though. It's the journey. It's not the destination. Right. And I think a lot of people get depressed because they're expecting that destination to do it. And I'll admit I was there as well is when I'm like when I make six figures a year, damn, I'm going to be loaded. Right. I never want to make you make six figures. I'm like, huh, it's not what I thought it was going to be. Maybe if I make multi six figures that's when i'll be loaded right <laughs> no a seven figure company is what i need to be no no it's still not there like, no eight, man it's I, gonna be when you get the private jets going that's that that's... well maybe that's it i'll let you know right i'm like because <laughs> i'm not there yet but you know there will always like you say there will always be something else whether it's physical or not it's kind of what's it progress is happiness like if you are making progress in whatever it is that you're working on and that could be just running a charity or running a business or being a, the best teacher the best mom and the best dad you can be that is what makes us happy. It's not this like we reach a destination. It's not like my kid went off to college. Poof, I'm done. I'm happy, right? You, it's the progress you made there and you continue being a parent afterwards. It's not I made a six-figure, seven-figure, eight-figure exit. At that point, you still have to find other ways to grow. Otherwise, you're just it's the people who retire early, right? And then they die early because they have no goals in life anymore. I can't imagine that. Rolling stone g- gathers no moss, they say. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. So I plan on... One, I plan on living forever. And two, I'll be a rolling stone the, stone the entire time. <laughs> you got to get into the longevity space. Uh, what is uh, the, the rumors? Uh, Peter Thiel or whoever in Silicon Valley getting the... Uh, Trust me, I read the articles. I'm on those newsletters. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm reading them. Like, I'm, you know, I half joke, but half not. But I'm like, okay, I do think we are... <laughs> if we have bad enough luck, it'd be like the day after I die, they'll figure out like the the pill, like the pill for like longevity or something like that. Well, like, you know the uh, Boston Dynamics lady. So uh, how do we get our brains uploaded into a robot? That might be what it takes. But even the anti aging stuff, like I mean, there's some cool science going on there. I mean, it's only in rats, but you know, they've shown that like biologically, it's technically possible, and we never know, right? Because for all we know, there's somebody right now in MIT sitting there and is like, right this morning they discovered. The secret to, I mean, immortality is biological, you know, it's just like aging better, right? It's not like in the, the Wolverine, the movies where you chop off somebody's head and it, you know, sucks itself back onto it. None of that kind of stuff. But maybe to an age where we just don't die of old age anymore and a lot of the inflammation and cancer related stuff doesn't happen. You'll still die if you get hit by a car and do something stupid. Somebody shoots you. But how cool would that be? You might be too to a point. To risks though, if you if you know that like you're gonna live forever, then it's gonna be. make a big change in society, right? Because yeah. anyway, we could go down this one business. Then all you have to do is invest like a thousand dollars now and just sit there in a cave for the like next five hundred years and you're like a billionaire just with compounding interest, right? I'm like, you know, if you just wait long enough, you're gonna have a lot of money. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, you can hibernate. So there's there's gonna be all these things, and I'm sure the wealthy people are gonna have access to it first instead of the poorer people. So suddenly the wealthier are gonna get wealthier. And 
Mm. Yeah, there's a whole and overpopulation. There's, there's a whole bunch of ethical questions tied. Maybe to that. part two uh, on the podcast. Exactly, here. exactly. Talk, talk about exactly. Mortality effects. <laughs> cool. That's cool. One last thing I wanted to touch on uh, before we wrap up here. So uh, you and your wife are business partners. Uh, what are what what's that like? Lessons learned? Do you recommend it? What, you know, what do you have to say about that? Great question. So what I tell people when they ask is, if you start a business with your wife, there are only two possible options. You have a really strong relationship or you get divorced. There is no middle ground. Like there's nothing where like, oh, nothing really changed. And the strong relationship chance I'm saying is about 20% and the divorce is about 80%, right? That that So long story short, probably not a good idea for most people to do it. Um, going back to what we talked about before, not knowing what I didn't know, we just didn't know not to do it, right? Um, I give a lot of credit. You know, I believe we've come to the, have a very strong relationship side of things, but I give a lot of credit to my wife because she's a Latina and she knows how to argue. Um, now, how does that help? One of the issues we have, I'm generalizing, in the United States is we're taught to, at least in my family, avoid conflict, right? You know, we just don't like arguing. So we kind of keep things bottled up inside and you know, we don't want to cause a fuss and all the rest of it. In business and in personal relationships, that's not necessarily a healthy thing, right? It's like having a pressure cooker with no release valve. It's like, you know, it builds up, builds up, and that's only have this big fight. And like, you've been leaving the socks on the floor for the last five years. Nothing you can do about it now. It's been five years. If you told him, you know, if he or she had told you that five years ago, you just start picking up the socks. But like, it's all done, right? We argued a lot the first 12 months of our marriage. Like we got married in the building, which was our first school because we couldn't afford it. And we had like a taco lady come because we couldn't afford anything more than that. And we argued a lot that first year. And for me, it was very uncomfortable because like arguing is just not something I've done very much. But looking back, I realized it was us letting off steam almost every single, you know, not every day, but like every few days, we were just letting off a little bit of steam. So nothing became this huge thing, which like ended our relationships in the long term. So that was one of the keys to our longevity. And the second one is luckily we have very different skill sets. She's a teacher and I'm a business person, marketer and an engineer. Um, and we run education businesses. So I don't poke my nose into the education side too much. And she doesn't poke her nose into the marketing and, you know, business management side of things. And we respect each other's opinion within those fields. And that has helped us out a lot as well. So I'm not going in there telling the teachers what to do. And she's not coming in here and telling me what to run on Facebook ads or doing for SEO. Um, those are, I think, been the two keys for us having a long-term relationship. So separate your, divi your divisions and learn how to argue if you're going to start something with your wife. The real question is, uh, what happens to marriage if we start living forever? Uh, that's the real question here. So uh, funny anecdote, in Mexico, you can actually get married for a certain amount of years. There are actually marriage contracts that are set term, for like term marriage, term, term, term marriage contracts. So like, <laughs> maybe 100 years? I have no idea what, what would happen at that point. Um, do you, when you when you propose, do you say it then like, uh, honey, I'd like to, uh, you know, spend the next eight years with you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> eight, eight to 15 years. We'll give you a range, right? So you, I can get out at any point. Let me just sign on the dotted line. Yeah, there'd be a lot of stuff we'd have to deal with if we all live forever. And that, I'm sure that would be one. Because we all change as human beings too. You know, what, maybe in one lifetime, not so much. But imagine in five lifetimes, how different we everybody would be, right? Right. This was awesome. Uh, love the uh, love the time together. Maybe a part two sometime. But uh, awesome. thanks for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Brian. It was a blast. Yeah.